everyone. Welcome back to Watch with Marcel, where today we are here for another movie review. This past weekend, I, like most of the planet, went and saw Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. Oh, don't believe the haters. This is actually the best of the Ant-Man franchise. This movie was amazing. I loved it. I really did. I actually really, really did. And I was surprised because going in, the Ant-Man movies have never been my favorite. They're not terrible. They're just not my favorite. They are probably the lower ranking of the Marvel movies, in my opinion. The lowest Marvel movie being Thor Dark World. I think we can all agree on that. Am I right? Yeah. So, going into this, I thought, you know, not going to expect much, but the trailers showed me Kang, so my expectations were a little higher than normal for an Ant-Man movie. So, this section, spoiler free. So let's talk about the movie in general. Just no spoilers. Let's just talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp's Quantumania. First things first, why is the title so dang long? Couldn't we have just called this Ant-Man? I guess not. I guess it doesn't quite roll off the tongue. Ant-Man, Quantumania. I mean, I guess it does. You know, just Ant-Man, Quantumania. Why do I have to go through the whole Ant-Man and the Wasp? Who's in this movie, but is she really? So let's jump right to one of my complaints. I only have a few. I don't really have that many, but one of my complaints is Hope Van Dyne. She's just there in every sense of the phrase. She's just there. She does come in clutch. Uh, in a couple times, you know, she's hope. Of course she does. But on a whole, I don't feel her in this movie. I don't feel her chemistry with Scott. I don't feel her as part of the family. I know everybody's going to disagree. Come at me. I'm ready. Let's talk about it. I want to talk about it because I just hope let's hope is my biggest problem with this movie. As you've seen from the spoilers, the basic concept of this, you know, the basic plot behind this story is that Cassie's been messing with things she shouldn't be messing with. But good honor for learning all of this in the short amount of time that has passed since the blip. She has become an expert in quantum physics. She's been hanging out with Hank. And uh, she's created a signal down to the quantum realm. And Janet is not happy about it. And she freaks out. And instead of just calmly using her words, she pulls the plug, which... Things go bad, everybody gets sucked into the quantum realm, and that's where the movie starts. And we spend the entire two hours and maybe five minutes dealing with the quantum realm. It's good. It's really good. It's really, really good. So that's as spoiler-free as I can give you. I really enjoyed it. The chemistry between the rest of the family and Scott and Cassie and Kang and Hank and is great. It's just hope. It's just hope. Okay, so let's get into the spoiler section where we just full on just talk about this movie. So let's just go. I made some notes. I've got some clips playing in the background to keep me focused <laughs> so I don't go off the rails. And let's just start off with Scott. So Scott takes a great journey in this film. Scott has always been one of those had greatness kind of thrust upon him types. You know, he didn't set out to become a superhero. And then he just kind of fell into being a superhero. He went and helped Cap in Germany and then got arrested for it. And, you know, he saved the world because a rat let him out of the quantum realm. So a rat really saved the world. Scott helped, but a rat really saved the world. So Scott is just like this every man who is also a superhero. So he's written this book <laughs> and he's on this book kick and I'll, he spends a lot of time in the movie talking about this book that he's written. He's listening to the podcast in the car and it's a whole central theme to the movie, his look out for the little guy book. And he's reading it to a group of people. The whole town loves him except for the deli coffee shop owner who confuses him for Spider-Man, which is hilarious. That's in the trailer. Wasn't a big surprise. We all knew that was coming. But Scott does have some growth in this movie. He actually becomes the hero that we all kind of need and want. 
And I enjoy that growth for Scott. I really do. It actually makes Scott a more fleshed out character. And the other central theme of this issue dealing with Scott are father issues. And who in the world doesn't have those? Come on. Cassie and Scott go through a lot in this movie. And it's really cool. I really like their dynamic. It's a shame they had to recast her, but Catherine Newton actually does a great job as Cassie, and I can't wait to see where she takes Cassie from here. She'll be great in Young Avengers, especially seeing her dynamic with uh, Haley Steinfeld. That'll be great. I can't wait to see that. Is that coming? Is that official? Do we know that? Or are we all just like, you're going to be great in Young Avengers. You're going to be great in Young Avengers. That kid that was weird little Loki is going to be great in Young Avengers. Let's do this. Is it actually real, though? Do we know? I forget. I don't remember. Anyway, next up on my list is Catherine Newton. From the second she stepped out of that jail cell, she was Cassie. There was never a question. Like, she was immediately Cassie. From the look she gave stepping out of that jail cell, she was Cassie. And she, you know, she wants to be a hero. She is very unhappy with the way things are after the blip. This movie brings up another instance of things going wrong because of the blip that we just probably never thought about. So. She's very upset about the people that have been displaced by the blip. They come back five years later and somebody else owns their house now. And so what are we supposed to do? They're homeless. So she's fighting for the little guy and she used PIM technology to shrink a cop's car, which is hilarious. But she's great. She is really, really smart and she has her own suit. And I kind of love, there's a scene where she's, she gets her suit on and she's fighting, but she keeps bouncing off of things because she's not doing it right. And Scott comes over and it's a great father-daughter moment where he tells her she has to tap, punch, tap, punch. And it's really cute. And I love that scene. Momentum, right? Jump, tap. You see what I did? No, you're like this small. So I really enjoyed Catherine Newton as Cassie. Next up, this movie kicks off Marvel's phase five. Sure, it's the multiverse saga. I kind of wish this movie had been part of phase four because phase four was real weak as far as movies go. It had movies I loved. Love Shang-Chi, standout film. Really, really enjoyed it. Wakanda Forever, loved it forever. Thor Love and Thunder, ooh, not so much. Not so much. It's not terrible. It's just. It tried too hard to be Thor Ragnarok, but we're not here to talk about Thor. That's another day. We can do a ranking video if you want. Let me know down below in the comments if that's something you want. My rankings of all of the Marvel films. I can do that, but we're here to continue talking about Quantumania. So this kicks off phase five and the eventually it's going to lead into this Kang dynasty and the new Avengers and Secret Wars and all of these things. Great. That's great. So Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania kicks off phase five and uh, that's fine, but I really do wish that it had kicked off phase four maybe or ended phase four. I'm not sure. I just know I'm not entirely happy with it kicking off phase five. So phase four had some big stinkers <laughs> in it. Let's just be honest. It had some stinkers. It had some winners. Shang-Chi technically is part of phase four, right? Uh, Wakanda Forever, phase four, which technically was the end of phase four. And then the stinkers, Thor Love and Thunder. It just tried too hard to be Thor Ragnarok. If it would have just been a Thor movie and not relied on the humor, it wouldn't have been as bad. But Oh, I apologize to Thor Dark World. It is not the worst Marvel film. There's one worse that I forgot about because it was so bad. I completely forgot about it. And it's part of phase four, I believe. And that would be the Eternals. What a steaming pile of dung. Oh, I'm sorry if there are Eternal fans out there. That movie had a lot of promise, had a great trailer. It just tried to do too much, but we're not here to talk about Marvel's failures. We can do a ranking video down the line sometime if you fanboys and fangirls out there want to hear this fangirl's opinions on how the Marvel films are ranked. I can do that in another video, but let's keep talking about Quantum Mania. All right, next up, we've got Jonathan Majors. I don't even know where to start. Sir, 
If you somehow get your hands on this video, chef's kiss, you are everything. This is your movie, sir. It may say Ant-Man and the Wasp when it should say Kang Quantumania because you, you know, it takes a special kind of actor to be able to play multiple roles and make you forget sometimes that that same person is playing these multiple roles. Tatiana Maslany and Orphan Black is a master class in how to do that. So is Jonathan Majors. Every version of this character, every variant that he has portrayed so far has been compelling. He Who Remains had this boyish, giddy, just charm about him. But also he had the weight of the universe and the multiverse on his shoulders and you could feel it. Kang... Kang is a lot like Thanos. He's not wrong. His methods just aren't right. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? You know, his ultimate goal here is he's trying to stop something horrible from happening. It's just that the way he's going about it is not good. He's killing millions of people, millions of timelines, and he doesn't care because it's the end goal to stopping the multiversal war. So, oh, Kang is so compelling. And then one of the end credit scenes that we get, which we'll talk about a little later, is this Council of Kangs. And each one he plays is so different. There's that weird one. Well, we'll talk about it later. But just Jonathan Majors is amazing. And his chemistry with each individual person in this film is so different. It's sick. It's like sick in a good way. Like I can't, I'm just baffled at how amazing he is. And if you've seen any of the trailers for Creed 3, wow. And Lovecraft Country and just everything he does is amazing. He's a world-class actor. And here's my problem with award shows. He will not get recognized for being Kang unless it's like a sci-fi award or something like that. He's not going to win an Oscar for this. He should be nominated. Thankfully, we got Angela Bassett nominated for Wakanda Forever. Will she win? Well, we shall see. The Oscars haven't happened yet, but we shall see. Probably not. She deserves to because she was great. But Marvel, genre, these type of films don't get those major acting awards, but he acted his ass off in this film and it was amazing. When he says, hey, Jelly Bean, to Cassie, this like shiver went down my spine because it was both comforting and threatening all at the same time. So scary. So scary. All right. Now, let's talk a bit about Michelle Pfeiffer, Michael Douglas. It would have been very easy to just, after Ant-Man and the Wasp, just take Hank and Janet and kind of let them retire off into the sunset and just be side pieces. No, that didn't come out right. <laughs> side characters is what I meant. <laughs> but they didn't do that. Hank and Janet are just as much major characters in this film as they are, as Scott and Cassie are. Hope is not. Hope is not a main character in this movie. She just isn't. But Janet, this is all about Janet. And Hank comes in clutch. Hank and his aunts come in clutch. Oh, I loved it so much. <laughs> There's just so much. I could sit here for hours and talk about it, but I just want to give you little highlights in my thoughts. So I really do enjoy the character development that they continued in this movie with Hank and Janet. It is wonderful. Janet lied to everybody when she came back and she didn't even mention everything that's going on in the quantum realm. She just didn't mention it because she didn't want to disturb it. She had to keep Kang in the quantum realm because she knew if he got out, Shit was going to get bad. 
So she just didn't say anything. Unfortunately, Cassie messes with stuff that she shouldn't be messing with. And we all get sucked into the quantum realm. And now Janet has to tell everyone what's down here. And we have to stop it. Unfortunately, for some weird, unknown quantum physics reason, when they get sucked into the realm, not everybody lands in the same place. So we've got an A and a B storyline. you got Cassie and Scott in one place with some rebels. And you've got Hank, Hope, and Janet in another place dealing with other things. It's great. It's great to follow both tales. I do believe I really like the tale with the rebels more because I loved that little weird pink gel man. <laughs> drink the ooze. Drink the ooze. It's the closest I'm going to get to a translator microbe in the Marvel Universe. You drink the ooze and you suddenly understand everyone. I need this in my life and I love that it's in this story. I loved it. It was a great, great little side plot. Plus, that character was hilarious. And it's voiced by the guy who is, um, what's his name, Victor in this? David Dot, Dot. David D. He's in this movie. Uh, he's in the first two movies. He's one of Scott's friends. Victor, I think, is his name. And uh, he's on the What If series. And he's in uh, DC. He's Polka Dot Man. And he was on The Flash as... Abracadabra me? Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. He's done a lot, but he's in this movie. And that leads me to another thing about this movie that I didn't like. I miss Scott's friends. Scott's friends are a huge part of the first and second movie, and they're just not in this at all. And even worse than just not even being in this, they're not even mentioned. And I know that the director said that they weren't in this because this movie takes place in the quantum realm. True, sure, but there is also a great portion of time spent in this movie. It's a great amount of time spent kind of recapping Scott's life. We find out that Hope is doing all of this great stuff at Pim Van Dyne Industries. She's saving the world. Scott wrote a book and he's walking through town and all the time we spent walking down the street with Scott, high-fiving people and doing all of that. We quickly could have had a one-shot scene of an update of Scott and his friends, hanging out with his friends. Michael Pena, David D., uh, P.I. That's all I needed. Just a quick little, hey guys, there you are. You know, that's it. I mean, do I wish that Michael Pena's Luis could have got sucked into the quantum realm and seen him dealing with some of this stuff? Yes, because imagine his reaction to MODOK. <laughs> ah, oh, what could have been? This movie needed, at the very least, Michael Pena. That's all I'm saying. We needed Luis. We did. It was great, but we needed him. Okay. So, back to uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and Michael Douglas. I don't know how I got so far away from the two of them, but they were great in this movie is all I'm trying to say. They were wonderful. Hank had some development. Who, oh, who had, whose little heartstrings weren't pulled at the family dinner when they had that little pizza and they made it with Hank, with PIM technology, they made it bigger. Nice nod to Back to the Future. I love that. And then my little heartstrings went boop, boop. And Cassie called Hank Grandpa. I love that. Talk about Judy Greer, but we don't see her in this movie. I know there's a lot of characters that you had to bring back, but you had time. You know, we could have had, she could have been at family dinner, mixed family. We could have blended family, had everybody at dinner, her and Bobby, Cannavale, they could have all been there at one family dinner. I mean, we had enough time to show a quick shot of Scott having lunch with Jimmy Woo, which I loved in the close-up magic with the credit card. Fantastic nod. But you had time to do that little nod, but we didn't get Luis. I mean, oh. Michelle Pfeiffer and, Mike, and Michael Douglas are great in this. Let's move on. <laughs> All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is that probability storm. Later in the movie, uh, when they, so the main goal, we find out that Janet took the core of Kang's ship and she made it she made it really big really really big so he needs Scott to go in and put little pim disks on it to make it small again so that he can put it back in his ship and he can go out and he can mess up the universe that's his main goal so he kidnaps Scott and Cassie he's going to kill Cassie if Scott doesn't do it classic villain okay 
So while Scott's down there trying to get into this core, he enters this probability storm, which makes that Spider-Man meme times a million. So Scott's got different versions of himself that keep popping out of himself. He's like multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And the best part of that was <laughs> the version that pops out that's Jack from... <laughs> It's Scott from Baskin Robbins and he's wearing the Jack uh, uniform and it's in the Baskin Robbins uniform and it's hilarious. Paul Rudd, his comic, his comedic timing is insane. He's just wonderful. And he's wonderful in this movie and he's always been a wonderful Scott Lang. He does a great job with this character. I mean, it's basically Paul Rudd. It's the charming everyman and that is Paul Rudd. So he's perfect. There's also a scene down in the probability storm where they're all kind of rushing the core and one of them becomes giant man and he unravels. And the first thing that I thought of is that scene in Infinity War when they go to nowhere and they're trying to stop Thanos and he already has the reality stone and he makes ribbons of Drax and it's all icky. Or he ribbons out Mantix and makes cubes of Drax? It's one of those. That's what it reminded me of. And that's what I thought of in the probability storm. It was just reality unraveling, just kind of ribboning. And that giant man just becomes ribbons. Except for his helmet, the helmet lands whole, which made no sense to me. Anyway, moving on. Love the probability storm. One of my favorite parts of the movie. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about Modoc. I have such conflicting feelings about MODOK. So MODOK comes back, comes to the Marvel Universe in this movie, and the way they explain MODOK is it's Darren. Darren got, in the first movie, Darren got sucked into the quantum realm, and all of his parts got squished into his big giant head, and Kang saved him, used his technology to make him MODOK. The face. When that armor comes off, when he's in the armor, he's terrifying, except for his little weird baby legs. And there is a quote where Scott's like, I just saw the baby legs. <laughs> Modoc does give some well-deserved comic breaks to this movie. It, it is kind of the way that you insert humor in a movie. You know, it's not well, it's not ill-timed like in Thor Love and Thunder. It's just funny. Now the kind of, the graphics of his big giant face made me laugh immediately. And unfortunately, I, I wanted to see this opening weekend because I love you all dearly, but the internet spoils everything and I didn't want to be spoiled. So I wanted to see it with an audience and I wanted to see it opening weekend. Because Marvel movies are meant, you know, they're one of the few things that I actually still enjoy going to the theater to see. Except I didn't enjoy my crowd. My crowd was not into it. I needed a big crowd reaction. I was laughing alone sometimes. I mean, my, my mom was there with me and she was laughing with me. But nobody else in the theater was laughing. Does that mean it wasn't funny or people just aren't used to laughing? I don't know. But they just weren't into it. And they all got up before the credit. The second you all know Marvel, this many years in, we know there's going to be two scenes, a mid and an after. Sit your butt back down. Half the theater left. Okay. But I needed that emotional response from the theater, and I just missed that. But the one kind of time where they did, everybody giggled at Modoc <laughs> when that big giant face reveal came, and. Corey Stoll is just such an attractive man. There's something about him. He's just so attractive, but not as a big old giant face with baby legs. Nope. He was just, I just giggled. But he also had one of the best parts of the movie and one of the best lines in, well, my name is Darren and I'm not a dick. I loved his redemptive arc in this. He, you're not quite an Avenger there, buddy, but you know, you're on the B squad. You're the B squad. And, you know, if you're mostly a machine, maybe we can fix you up and bring you back and we'll see more of you. But who knows? I'm, I'm not sure. But it was a good redemptive arc because he was so obsessed with being so powerful. And then all of this happened to him. And then he was this perfect killing machine. And then he realized he was just being used. And 
Cassie makes him realize that. And she tells him that it's never too late to stop being a dick. And he's right. She's right. It's never too late to stop being a dick. Internet haters. Just going to say. Take that to heart. If we learn one lesson from Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, it's never too late to stop being a dick. All right, now let's move on to what is possibly one of the best guest cameo roles that I knew nothing about, Bill Murray's Krylar. Wow, Bill Murray, you're just a gem. You're just a treat, sir. You really are. He <laughs> was so funny and such a little character that, could have meant nothing, but he injected so much history in such a short time. We got to see this glimpse of who Janet was in those 30 years that she spent in the quantum realm. And, you know, that little creature did not deserve to be eaten. And it didn't want to be eaten. And it was so sad. <laughs> and I'm so glad that Hank made one giant. And I hope, I hope, we didn't get to see it on screen, but I hope that that thing devoured Bill Murray. I hope it did. Well, he said no because that's what he did to its mate or friend or litter. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about post credits. There were two. Like I said, half my theater got up and left, so they didn't see it. The first post credit was the Council of Kangs. Whew, there were so many. Jonathan Majors, how can you do so many different Kangs? He had the scary Kang. I didn't like that one. The one that seemed to be in charge. It's creepy. And then you had this sort of Egyptian Kang that was also kind of creepy. And he gives them each a different voice. And it's so good. And then you open up into like this giant, reminded me of like the Coruscant Senate chambers where you had all these Kangs. And there was like this weird sycophant one that was so excited and screaming. You had this weird like, uh, Planet of the Apes one that was kind of creepy and just so many too many to look at and it came straight from the comic from what I understand and it was glorious and scary all at the same time and that's why it paired up very well with the end scene of Scott you know this movie's book ended with Scott walking down the street and in the beginning of the movie it's all happy go lucky and you know Here's what happened since the last time you saw me. And in the end, he's like, this is great. We stopped Kang. Everything is, we did stop Kang, didn't we? But he did say, you stopped me and something worse is, oh God, what did I do? Did I just kill everybody? And it's really the first time you see that on screen where the, like, a superhero is just like, shit, did I mess everything up? Nah. It's going to be fine. And even later on at dinner with, you know, they're at dinner kind of celebrating Cassie's not birthday because he's missed so many. And he's still sitting there like, oh, God, did I mess everything up? He can't stop thinking about it. He's really kind of freaked out. And from the look of this council of Kangs, yeah, he screwed everything up and we're in for it. This is going to be bad. It's going to be real bad. Our second post credit scene is more of a sneak peek of Loki season two, which thank you. Didn't know I needed that in my life. I can't wait for that. If you've seen my reactions to Loki season one, you know I adored that show and its glorious purpose. And I can't wait for season two. And I can't wait to get a sneak peek of season two. Can we have a trailer already? Please, 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 please. I need it. I need it. I need it. <laughs> I need it. Like now. <laughs> you know, that would have been really cool. And it would have been like a um, phase five kickoff, you know, oh, that would have been so neat. Because if you remember way back when, when we saw Captain America, after Captain America was over, we got our first trailer for Avengers. Now, granted, I would have been like, shit, I can't look at this <laughs> because I like to watch trailers. And I had to do that with John Wick. I was sitting there. I had folded my earlobes into my ears and I was humming to myself and I had my eyes shut like a child <laughs> so that I couldn't because they played the John Wick trailer before Ant-Man. And I hadn't seen it yet. And I was filming it that night, like that next day, actually, I was filming it for you guys. And so I just hummed to myself. The second post credit scene is Loki. And it is, uh, what was his name? Mobius 
and they are back in like the I don't know 18, 17, 18, 1900s sometime. <laughs> They're back in the day. They're back in the past. And they are watching a presentation and it is another variant of Kang. Victor no, what is his name? Let me know down below in the comments what his name is because I forgot. Timely, I think his name is. Something. And he is telling this enraptured crowd about time travel and he's invented something. And this is bad. And Loki is terrified because remember at the end of Loki season two, uh, season one, he showed up and things were taken over by Kang and he was really scared. Really, really scared. Mobius didn't know who he was. There were statues of Kang everywhere. It was terrifying. Ooh. So I guess he works for the TVA now, maybe? I don't know. I can't wait to see our first official trailer for Loki season two. When is that coming? Can I have that? I want it. I want it now, please. Anyway, so we end this movie kind of the same place we were when we started it, <laughs> almost. We don't know what's going on. We don't know who our new threat is. Well, we know who our th new threat is. It's Kang's, plural. And, uh, but we don't know when or how or why or what. We have, no we have no idea. But this was a great movie. I really enjoyed it a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. I will see it again. I don't know if I will wait until it comes to Disney Plus in like four months or something, but maybe, probably. Unless a friend of mine hasn't seen it and they want to go see it, and then I'll go see it again because I did really enjoy it. It was great. It really was great. It was way better than Thor Love and Thunder, that's for sure. Where does it fall? Hmm. <laughs> Let me think about that for a second. Where would I put this? It's definitely the best of the Ant Men movies of the Ant-Man kind of trilogy, I would definitely put it first among those movies. Where would I rank it overall in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? How many movies have there been overall? Middle of the pack. Let's put it in the middle of the pack. It's solidly in the middle of the pack. Otherwise, I'd have to think about it a little more and look at a list of all of the movies to see where. So if you want to see that ranking, let me know down below in the comments. While you're down there, let me know what you thought of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania as well. Because let's, let's go back for one second because I do want to talk about, just real quick, I want to talk about Hope. Because I almost forgot. And that's my problem with Hope in this movie, is she is forgettable. And I know someone's gonna, somebody out there is going to disagree, and that's okay. But to me, she just, she's just there. I don't feel the chemistry with her and Scott at all. I just, there's, there's nothing there. Like, she sacrifices everything to go back and save him. She sacrifices everything to go save her parents because they get sucked in and she chooses to go to the quantum realm. And she chooses to go back to the quantum realm when Scott makes his decision to stay behind and stop Kang. And I should feel something about that, and yet I don't. I don't feel like she's making these big sacrifices. I just feel like she's doing the hero thing. I don't feel her connection to Scott. I don't feel her connection to Cassie. And boy, do I hate that haircut. Whew! Woof, I hate it. I just, it's, I, I just don't like it. But that's, that's, that's a personal preference. Just don't, don't like it. Like the suit. I just don't like her hair in this one. Um, but who cares? It's just hair. It's just hair. It has no bearing whatsoever on her, her portrayal of the character or anything. I just don't like the haircut myself. But Hope is brilliant and Hope is a badass and Hope is a, Hope is a hero. You know, she chose this life and she's, she's kind of like Bruce Wayne in a way. She's got this huge multi-billion dollar corporation. She's doing good for the world and she's also a hero. And yet there is something lacking in Hope. And I don't know what that is. It's just not there for me. And it's not Evangeline Lilly's fault. It's not even the writing's fault. The, and it's not Paul Rudd's fault. It's just all of these things combined just don't make, f they just, they just aren't enough for some reason. It's just, it, it, it's not just this movie. It's from the very start. I just have not been that into hope. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe you guys can tell me.
The other things that I liked about this movie, I loved the Rebels. I love that we get to see Chidi from a good place. I forget his actual name. I apologize. But he's a great character and he could come in clutch in some things because he can read minds and it's great. Which could be very not great all the time. Knowing what everyone's thinking and if they're lying and all this. I don't know that I would like that power. But he's a great character and he was funny. I liked him a lot. Uh, things I didn't like. Like I said, Hope. Didn't like Hope very much. Um, and then there's only one little plot point that kind of irked me. And if I had to change one thing about this movie, it would be this. And it's at the end of the movie, like I said, Scott makes the decision to stay behind to stop Kang. Hope comes back and she decides to help. She has that great Sarah Connor Terminator moment where she's using her stingers and she's fighting against Kang and it's she's pushing him back and back and further, further back from the portal so he can't get to the uh, to our realm and they stop him and she pushes him back into the core and the core sucks him in and he's all tiny he could look like modok who knows i don't know what's gonna happen who knows but anyway all of that happens and then her and scott are stuck in the quantum realm it'd have been really great if it took a long time if they were down there a long time because they saw the rebellion celebrating and what was going on down there and if they made all these contacts and just hung out there for a while but instead for some reason cassie's like beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, up, up, there's the portal come on home it would have been better to kind of take that end scene and maybe make it a post credit scene and had some time passed and then Cassie figured out how to bring them back that way. I'm fine with the way she brought them back, but I'm just, I wish it would have taken a little bit longer than her just immediately jumping on there, popping in some keys and she brought them home right away. Kind of like diminishes the sacrifice that they made to choose to stay behind. If they would have known it was going to be that easy to just come back out, which then like now we have this thing that can, this open doorway, we can just open anytime we want to go back and forth. I don't know. A little too, uh, a little too easy. A little too easy there for me. Um, that's my only complaint, really. That's the biggest one I have, and that's, I'm looking at my list, I don't see anything else. Let me know what you guys thought of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania down below in the comment section. While you're down there, don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, share, do all those things. I really want to know what you thought of this. I give this movie two big thumbs up. I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to hear what you thought. Till next time, till the next movie. See you later. Bye.